Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Welcome to the Vision for You group of Union. We meet here every Thursday night, and we don't usually meet here. We meet up in the front, but there's a, another equally important event taking place tonight. It looks like a pre-K graduation. Um, and, and so we celebrate tonight a, a little graduation of our own. We're going to vary our format a little bit this evening. Also, we're going to have a speaker, but we're going to take a few minutes to uh, recognize group members who are celebrating uh, milestones, some anniversaries, and uh, that's how we do it here in AA. And I just saw both of the gentlemen coming in, and I had hoped they had someone ready to present them with their coins, and I asked Peter if he had anybody. He says, no, you could do it. And then I asked Walt, I said, did you have anybody to give you a coin? He says, no, I don't have anybody. And then he said, you can do it. <laughs> so unaccustomed as I end the public speaking, uh, I'll, I'll give it a try. It's really an honor. Uh, however it came together, it came together. But uh, both of these gentlemen have been instrumental in, in my recovery. Um, Walt was one of the first gentlemen I met. Well, before I start that, let's, let's, let's start the meeting in a traditional fashion with the serenity prayer. And those who, who care, please join in. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Uh, serenity, courage, and wisdom. Uh, and we'll see that tonight up here at the podium uh, once I sit down. But, uh, Walt, I, I met Walt. Walt was one of the first individuals who I met in, in, in our fellowship who let me know that there was something else besides meetings, who let me know that the steps were not just words written on a window shade, who let me know the difference between the 12 and 12 and the, and the book Alcoholics Anonymous, who told me through his words and through his actions about this program of action that was associated with the 12 step as they were written in that book, Alcoholics Anonymous. Walt is something of a wordsmith, so I, I will say tonight that he had the temerity to correct me one night on a share that I made from the floor, pulled me aside after a meeting. It was an afternoon, actually, and pulled me aside. And I didn't like that. <laughs> I didn't take it too kindly. I mean, it was a share, for goodness sake, you know. I just, But he had a point in mind, and he had a seriousness in mind also about that point. And that seriousness stayed with me long after the point was made. Uh, he was dead serious about those words that are contained in our first 164 pages. And if I'm sharing from the floor or if I'm speaking from the podium or if I'm writing a book, I need to be as precise and definite as he is about these words. And although I certainly was able to move on past that initial resentment, um, it just showed me the seriousness of the, of the fellow. And our past would cross from time to time. And from him, I, indirectly, I was led up to Berkeley Heights where I began to experience a solution. I began to experience some freedom from my alcoholism. And I, I, I'm grateful to him for that, and I want to thank him for that. And we, he's always been a part of, of what we've done, and we came together with the notion to, to put together a group in union that might be a little different than our average AA meeting. If we were really, really happy and, and enthralled with the meetings we were going to, we would have never had that conversation. But we did, and, and the conversation that ensued took in a lot of people in a lot of forms, and what we ended up with was a vision for you, literally and figuratively. And what we do is we come together here every Thursday night, and we share our particular message of experience, strength, and hope, that working the steps out of the big book, you can achieve freedom. And ironclad guarantees are made either in the driveway or from the podium or immediately after the meeting. And conditions met, conditions followed, and people get free. And to be a part of that is something that I surely would not have wanted to miss. And my friendship and association with Walt is, is very important to me. And, I, you know, I love both these guys. I love Bart, too. I love everybody here tonight. But I, I, I love I love both these guys. And... um the word friend 
is probably the best appellation I could give Walt. And right now, he's celebrating 15 years as Walter M. Hey, everybody. I'm Walt, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm not used to having this much volume. I'm listening to Charlie, and it's really by the grace of God in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the big book, the love and support found in these rooms, as well as the support I receive at home from my family. God, this thing is bothering me. Um, I'm listening to Charlie, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out who the heck he's talking about because it doesn't, it doesn't sometimes feel like that's how I reflect. But, and I think that's because hopefully... I've tried to be a little free from me and to let the power of God flow through me at certain times. And I have no idea that encounter he's talking about. I don't ever remember it. Just going to show that it's just that much more easier to give a resentment than to get one, I guess. I don't know. But, you know, as I look back past the, the last decade and a half, and it feels weird to say that, but, you know, 15 years, where did it go and what happened? And, and what have I done? And what's the quality of my life been? And what have I done with that time? It's not necessarily the accumulation of, of minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years. It's what I'm doing moment to moment with the, the time I'm given, the time I'm, I'm allotted. Quite frankly, I feel I'm living on borrowed time. And I have to give back to the society in, in so many ways that I can't even count, in measurable ways. I, I always feel that I'm drawing on the, the debit side of the ledger. So when I have an opportunity to pass on what's been given to me, I try to take advantage of it, capitalize on it, maximize it, whatever you want to call it. But I look back at the, the young kid that showed up here 15 years ago, just getting out of a treatment facility on June 23rd of 1992. June 24th, that's Peter's date. That's why it was in my mind. And congratulations to Peter's as well. And, you know, wandering out and thinking of the old Groucho Marx line, you know, do I really want to be associated with people, you know, like me? Really, do I want to be part of an association that would have me? And, you know, I've I've wondered that from time to time, but I know I have no other opportunity. I have no other option than to be here. This is the last stop. This is my last hope for salvation, for redemption, for transformation, to become something usefully whole, to find that spiritual center that I always I always was wandering looking for through other means and methods in life. Is that my time? Do I have to stop now? Um, and I always feel awkward celebrating because this is something I can't claim. It's not mine to, to stake. It's something I've been given. It, it's that last gasp that, that God injected me with to say, here's your two options, death and drinking or sobriety and, and spirituality. That's the only two options that I can live between. It's not whether or not I drink. It's what I'm doing with the moments I got and trying to grow closer to this power that for some reason allowed me to be here for as long as I have. And I don't think it's a very long time, quite frankly. Because there's a lot more work I gotta do. And if I think I'm done, then I'm, I'm doomed. You know, it, it's just amazing because the only thing that's kept me going from time to time has been the fellowship. And then when I found the, the spiritual program of action as outlined in the basic text, I mean, my life took off. And for a little while, I wondered, was it really worth the time that I accumulated? And regardless of what happened or didn't happen, I have to say yes. Because I met so many wonderful people along this journey. I've made so many great friendships that have come and gone, and that's okay because life is, is constant momentum. I'm not here to make friends, and, and I, that sounds a lot more callous than I mean it. But I'm here to save my life. And, you know, at whatever cost, and it's not to, to directly offend, and it's not meant to hurt, and it's not meant to harm. But, you know, if I wanted to make friends, I'd join a volleyball club. I do something. I take a, an adult course. I, there's lots of other ways for me to, to make friends. My only aim and option, and my only aim and hope here, is to just find that spiritual center, hold on to it for dear life, and continue going. And with that, I'm just going to shut up and take this thing and shove it down my throat if I feel like drinking. And I'll turn it back over to Charlie. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, Charlie's still an alcoholic. I, I dug these coins out of our, our box. Um, someone had entrusted us with a bunch of coins and literature when we got started that they had from a meeting and they no longer needed. 
And what are the chances of finding a 15-year coin and a 19-year coin and some other coins all, all stocked together? Last week, I just found exactly what I needed. We, we're going to have someone celebrate 90 days here, but she, was, she has another obligation. Um, so I, I carried all these coins around me today. You know, I felt kind of neat having like over 40 years of sobriety like in my pocket. Like, should I, should I ever need this? You know, it, it's right here. But, you know, there it was, a 15, a 19, everything I needed, you know. Just joking with Peter, I said I could find two tens, but you got to give me a one, you know. Um, it isn't really easy to sing the praises of a, of, a, of a teacher in public, of a spiritual teacher, you know, who's also a friend, who's also a home group member, who's also an alcoholic, just like me. Um, and I know there's a gentleman here that drove a long way to speak, so I'm going to try to keep it as brief as I can. Uh, I saw this gentleman speak in Summit, New Jersey a number of years ago. Somebody invited me up to a group anniversary. He said, you got to see this guy. He's a great speaker. And I, I wasn't familiar with the concept of circuit speakers or a speaker being anybody else than somebody that you asked five minutes before the meeting starts, would you speak tonight, uh, which is a, one of our traditions in New Jersey. But this was something a little bit different. And, and he forever... He forever changed how I would look at this sacred trust of standing behind a podium at the front of a room called Alcoholics Anonymous. I was of the school of a rambling roller coaster ride of a drunk log that had laughter and tears and inside references to other substances. And, and as I would look at the clock and we would draw to a close, I would announce that then I came into AA and my life, my life has never been better. We have a nice way of closing. And it seemed to work. People liked it. People said I had a great message, and or they liked what I had. Whatever. It seemed to work for a bit, but this gentleman was speaking about something else, and he continues to speak about something else. And there's plenty of that there. I mean, he told about the fishing trip, and I heard about guys. I grew up in Staten Island, and I heard about guys from Brooklyn that he was talking about that I felt like I knew intimately, you know. Only I was running from these guys because I usually owed them money or was on the short end of some sort of a ledger with these people. But I, I knew who he was talking about. I grew up with those guys. And he talked about them and his home group and, and talked about a lot of stuff, talked about some of, the, some of the concrete experiences in meditation that were about the opposite end of a, a spectrum from a fishing trip that went off the dock in Bay Ridge with a bunch of guys out of the Sopranos to an intimate spiritual awakening that he had and concrete stuff that he's experienced. And um, what happened was he began to move closer. He moved from Brooklyn to Staten Island, from Staten Island to Union, and we, or we began to become geographically closer, and he became involved in a circle of friends that were plotting this new AA meeting to spring on the unsuspecting public. <laughs> and we got together at a coffee shop up the road, and we put our heads together, and, and somewhere along the line I asked him if he would would sponsor me because I thought it would be a good thing being sponsored by someone I admired so much and had the admiration of a lot of other people I would maybe even get that by osmosis what I tried to get back in the beginning and one of the first things we dealt with was that I need you to be free of me as soon as possible and I was <laughs> why you know can I just tag along forever like you know I was going to be like Wally and the Beaver like we're just going to hang around forever you know but that's human power okay in a nutshell, my reliance on Peter M. from Union, New Jersey, is human power. Peter was going to clear up my channel, was going to remove some of the final obstacles that were blocking me. And we had a conversation on the phone, and he talked about something that was internalized and was really, really blocking me from the sunlight of the spirit. And he said, it's not a problem. He said, we see it, it's gone. And with those words of confidence that I had never heard before, he felt like he was looking right into my soul. And he said, we got it, it's on the radar screen. He said, it's as good as going right now. And I felt like a burden was lifted from me, you know, because we spoke the same language. And um, he's, con he's continued to be an inspiration to me, has taken me from where Walt took me to another place. Peter took me to a place where we, where we moved beyond AA. Not instead of, like he's fond of saying, along with, not instead of. And I had direct experience with other teachers from other fellowships. The book says, make use of where religious people are right. It says there are many other spiritual books. Well, Peter would, would show me distinctly and discreetly how to use those books. I could take a book like The Four Agreements and not just read it and put in my pile of spiritual books I have read. And when that pile gets to be a certain height, I'm then a good guy. But no, to read that book like I read the big book. 
underline and highlight and underscore and have a direct experience with these words, not to just go from cover to cover and say, okay, that one's done, give me the next book. Let me have the next guru, the next teacher. Let me race through all these and read as many of these as I can. That was, you know, that's spiritual materialism. That's not the sunlight of the spirit. And he directed me away from that to have an experience with this as I had experienced with our first 164 pages. And we did some neat stuff with inventory and current agnosticism and current unmanageability, not unmanageability from then, from days gone by, but what was it looking like right now, right here? And I started to squirm a little bit. And expectations for me were not being met. I thought this was going to be a joyride with the, you know, with, with Peter M. from Union, New Jersey. But it was a joyride. You know, and it, it was. And, I, you know, I, I, I don't know what to say. I really, I can't say enough about either of these two gentlemen, but right now to join us at the podium and celebrate 19 years is Peter M. from Union, New Jersey. My name is Peter. I'm a recovered alcoholic. <clears throat> Grateful to be alive and sober and at a sacred place called Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, first things first, thank my home group for allowing me to celebrate. Uh, I'm grateful to be a member of the Vision for You group. And like Charlie said, we started at a place called Van Gogh's Year, which was kind of like an ominous setting, Van Gogh's Year, and we're trying to start something spiritual. Um, uh, but here we are. Um, few years later and celebrating, and I'm very, very grateful to be alive and sober and part of this sacred uh, place called Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, thank Charlie for presenting the coins and um, the guys for setting up and Bill for being down here tonight. Uh, Bart and his friends for driving so far uh, uh, to get here. Um, we're going to hear a great talk tonight. I have friends here from different parts of Jersey. We have friends here from uh, Long Island, Queens. We have friends here from Staten Island. It's like the heads of the five families have gotten together tonight. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> we're going to divvy up the neighborhood. Um, before we get going, it's really important. There is so many folks in this group, so many teachers along the way. My sponsor, Mark H., my dad and my kid brothers, if it wasn't for the courage, strength, and direction that God gave them, I would not be here tonight celebrating. There's so many people along the path who have allowed me to get here tonight, orchestrated by a loving God. And a few years ago, I met someone who's been uh, 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 the apple of my eye, just absolute wonderful uh, uh, experience who allows me to go out and do the workshops you guys asked me to do and allows me to go out and travel and allows me to be here um, and has held me up a few times when I didn't think I'd have the courage to stand up. And if Linda would just stand up for a moment so everyone can see who you are. And, um, so, so. <clears throat> In the past couple of weeks, I've been in this place of reflection, not morbid reflection, but reflection, and God seems to do that to me every year around this time of year. I don't visit so much my past, but this time of year it just shows up. I wake up, and here I am reflecting upon where I was. And uh, it was this time 19 years ago I was in serious trouble. Um, I was in my seventh, and God willing, detox by now. Had been separated uh, from alcohol June 23rd. I was on my way to Minnesota. Um, I was very, very ill from alcoholism. I didn't think I'd have another shot at trying to get sober. My family pretty much was just hoping, you know, I would go peacefully. I mean, this was the last stop for me. But something happened uh, on my way into the seventh uh, treatment center. I hit what a book talks about, the bitter end, where circumstances of living the way I was living made me very, very willing to go to any lengths in order to recover from alcoholism. And on that, I got rocketed. And many times along the way, some of my past teachers were saying, you need to, like, take it easy. You're praying too much. You're doing too much big book work. You're doing too much of this stuff. But how can I deny spirit? When spirit moves you, you go. How could I edit spirit when spirit talks to you, you talk? And I'm so grateful for listening to the sixth sense that we get in here that says go, move, be teachable, listen. It has brought me where I am now with all my challenges and all my falling short. Because what I found out here over the last 19 years, Alcoholics Anonymous is about experiencing the glory of God and nothing less than that great fact. 
There's a quote uh, the carpenter said, he says something like, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. The glory of God, the gifts of God are out there, but how many of us are seeking it? And we bring that into Alcoholics Anonymous. The gifts that God has given us in Alcoholics Anonymous are plenty. They're there for us to have, to get free, beyond free, and experience His glory and experience bliss in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's no longer thinking about a drink anymore. Drink's been removed, and we get on in our life, spread the spiritual wings, and go work with others. Take this home. Go be employable. Have families. Do all the great things we get to do in practicing these principles. And yet over and over and over and over and over again, I hear so many of us in drama suffering from untreated alcoholism. Well, how do I get there? We have 12 tools, 12 simple principles, follow the directions and go. I haven't thought about a drink in many, many years, and that's truly by the glory of God, and that'll ruffle feathers in a lot of contemporary AA meetings. But that's my truth, and that's God, and that's freedom. So I feel blessed to be a a, a recovered member of this sacred place called Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you haven't found out that it is sacred yet, I pray you do, because it is. Because we see people get reborn and resurrected in Alcoholics Anonymous. Come in here with nothing broken and then arise. And then we walk and go work with others. What a good deal. What a good deal. I met our, our speaker a handful of years ago. He's become a, a dear friend to me. Uh, does a, is the guy responsible for fellowship with the Spirit in Queens, New York, every year? Has dedicated his life to Alcoholics Anonymous. And so we're in for a treat uh, uh, to hear tonight uh, from the primary purpose group in Long Island, New York, Bart R. Hi, my name is Bart, and I'm a recovered alcoholic. And thanks for having me here tonight. Um, when Peter was talking about reflecting, and uh, my home, my uh, sobriety date is June 12, 1995. So I also did that kind of reflecting this month. And what I came up with was a lot about what Peter was just talking about. You know, why am I still sober today? Why are people inviting me? And I'm allowed to leave the state of New York and come into New Jersey. Um, <laughs> People invite me into their homes. Why is that? And it's because I don't study that book, Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't read the books like Charlie was talking about from cover to cover and pile them up, but I try to actually incorporate them in my life. It's a design for living, and as long as I can do that and continue to do that, then I'm a recovered member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and people like to have me around. Um, If I stop living it and just start talking about it and stuff like that, then you'll find me drunk pretty quick. I know that. And that's why I'm still sober today for 12 years. Um, I want to thank Peter for asking me. Me and Peter have become very good friends over the last few years. And I was thinking about some of the trials and low spots that both of us have gone through together. Um, That's what we do in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. Besides the great program that we have, we have a fellowship um, where I learned what real friends are. And um, <clears throat> I remember a few years ago, it was probably about five years ago, um, I was in that one of those trials and low spots and um, didn't feel like I would be, you know, one of the promises in our big book is that we can go where other free men can go without any, you know, without any difficulty, without any trouble. Um, and that was true for me for a few years. And um, about five years ago, I got into this funk. And not that I thought that I was going to pick up a drink, but I didn't think that even with given sufficient reason, I could be in a place like a bar or um, I wasn't feeling on on good, safe ground. Um, My life was around me was a mess. And I remember being in a meeting one night and getting honest and, and sharing that at a meeting. And the next morning, my boss called me up and he said he had some work for me and it was in an area that I used to do some running. And I, and I never used to work there. And I remember calling Peter up on the way there and I was in tears and I was cursing God. Why do you have me going to this neighborhood? I was just finished telling a bunch of people last night, I don't feel safe in an area like this right now. 
Um, I called Peter and started talking to him about it. And he asked me to pull over. And he said, Bart, why don't you just consider this for a second? Is it possible that God has you in this neighborhood to show you that you can be there to earn a living today instead of crawling on your hands and knees? And I snapped right out of it. And I realized that was what was going on. And it pulled me out of the whole funk that I was in. Um, And he's pulled me through a lot of talks. I mean, I have a lot of good people in my life, and Peter happens to be one of them. Again, I want to thank him for the honor of speaking here tonight, and I want to um, congratulate Walter as well on celebrating and having me part of the anniversary. Um, I was thinking about, you know, there's a saying that a lot of us says, you know, if, if we make plans and God laughs. And I currently live in Long Beach, New York, I grew up in the city, and um, I was very active in my home group in Queens, the Utopia group, for about 11 years. Um, in the last two and a half, three years, I was very active in the Fellowship of Cocaine Anonymous, trying to see what I can give to them as well. And the group in Limbrook, the primary purpose group, asked me if I would do a big book study for them. And um, I finished one that I was doing in Flushing, Queens, and went out there, and every night they would ask me, you know, why don't you make this your home group and stay out here in Limbrook? And I told them, nope, it's, you know, I like it in Queens, and you know, I've had my same home group for a long time. And uh, then I met Tara, and I ended up getting engaged and living in Long Island. So if you have plans, God laughs. He's always got different plans. And my life is great living in Long Island. A little bit about myself. <sighs> Growing up, I guess, like, I'm one of those people that, like so many others, and it's not necessarily alcoholism, just not feeling a part of, very shy. Um, probably 10, 11 years old. I'm real bad with dates and ages. Most of my life is a blackout. I mean, I'm sober and, and of right mind for the last 12 years, and I still can't remember like simple things like introducing people or um, what I did an hour ago. but So the dates will certainly be wrong. Um, but I was young and I would look. I grew up in a neighborhood where we had apartment buildings and I would look out the window and I would see the older people drinking on the corner and having a lot of fun and those were my heroes. I just wanted to be with them having that fun. Um, before I knew it, that's what I was doing. I was hanging out with them, drinking, and having a lot of fun. Fifth grade, I was going to school, and I saw them hanging out in the park instead of going to school and having a lot of fun, and I decided that I was going to hang out with them in the park and drink, and school wasn't so important. Um, So by fifth grade, I was already being left back from school, because drinking was more important and more fun, and I was feeling a little bit more a part of than what I was feeling like in school. So they were going to leave me back, and they had a meeting, and my parents were moving, and they decided to promote me into the new school where we were moving. So that summer, um, I spent every day riding my bicycle back to the old neighborhood and drinking and meeting nobody in the new neighborhood. Because that was a fear of mine, meeting meeting people. Um, I still don't love it. I'm still not great at it. But um, it's the first day of school came, and I didn't know how I was going to do it. So I had a drink. And that soothed the fear of going to sixth grade, the new school, for the first time. Um, and I saw in the beginning of school that this was going to be the answer, that if I just drank at school, I'll get through school. Um, Then I shortly found the other kids that even grew up in that neighborhood that were drinking in school and hiding behind the handball courts and hanging out and drinking at school. So um, that's who I hung out with. And I started to get into a lot of trouble in school. And in midway through that year, there was a woman who came from a school called Project 25. It was an alcohol and drug program. And I was told that I had to come sit with her every once a week 
And I would go sit with her and talk with her and continue to get in trouble and continue to get caught drinking in school. And I was told that if I continue to come to school drunk, if they find alcohol in my locker, that I'm going to have to go to Project 25 full time. And that was a scary thought because I finally started to meet friends in school. And it meant I was going to have to start all over again. And that was a huge threat. But I didn't want to stop drinking either. So it wasn't too long before I was pulled out of school and put into Project 25. Um, Project 25, the consequences started to get much um, higher. My attitude started to get much, wor much worse. Um, they started to give my parents um, some suggestions that as a kid I didn't like. Um, like, lock them up. You know, send them away. Get a PINS petition. And so by sixth grade, that's what was starting to happen in my life. Um, I was always going to counselors, psychiatrists, therapists, you know, by my parents' orders, the school's orders. They all would tell me the same thing. If you just, you're just a nice boy, if you just didn't drink, you would be okay. And I still believe the lie that, and I would say it to myself, not to them, they don't understand. When I drink, that's when I'm okay. That's when I believe that I'm a nice boy that they're talking about. And other than that, I'm just not comfortable in my own skin, so I like this drinking stuff. Um, I started to get into a lot more trouble. I started to drink a lot more. I started to go to parties with all these people that were drinking a lot and going to the um, up by Fort Totten where we live or to the golf course and have keg parties. And all those kids were making it home every night. You know, I wasn't. I was doing stupid things. I was waking up in the morning, you know, wherever the party was. And the next day, the kids would make fun of me for the things that I did. And all I wanted to do was fit in, you know. So I would say at the next party, I'm not going to drink like that. I'm not going to do anything stupid. I'm not going to be called the man of the night and, you know, and be told all the idiot things that I did and said or, you know, start fights and wake up with a cracked jaw, even though I might have been one of the biggest kids there. I was so drunk. You know, somebody would always get a good shot in. I had no idea who it was. Um, things were bad at a young age, and I kept swearing I wasn't going to do that again. And I kept doing that again. Um, my mother was 120 pounds soaking wet. Um, may she rest in peace. Um, she'd beg me. You know, I had a sister that died young, and she would beg me. I already lost a daughter. I don't want to lose another child. Please don't go outside. Please don't leave this house. And like I said, she was 120 pounds soaking wet, a very loving, fragile woman. And I would pick her up and throw her away from the door and disappear for days at a time. Um, she made a beautiful home, and I would sleep in elevator shafts, um, in friends' garages, um, so that I could stay out for days at a time and drink. Drinking was very important to me. Around 1978, um, after being in a lot of shelters, um, my mother screaming when I'd get arrested, lock him up, he's an animal. My father coming over to me and saying, there's nothing I could do, your mother's got custody. Um, I went to a place for 18 months. Um, actually, it's important that even when I was locked up in some of these short-term places in Brooklyn and shelters and any place other than if it was Spofford, which I was in many times, um, I would sneak out of these places to go drink night train, you know, with the bums and sneak back into these places. Uh, finally, I got sent upstate to a place called Hawthorne Cedar Knolls, and that place was, I was there for 18 months. And while I was there, I started to reflect that maybe what they're saying is true. Maybe I drink too much, and when I get out of here... I'm not going to drink as much as I've been drinking. Um, so I spent the time up there, and I got in a lot of trouble up there, and I continued to even be able occasionally to sneak off grounds there and break into the deli and bring back beers and get into trouble. And um, But when I left there, I made that promise to myself that I was going to stick to it. And I went to high school, regular school, for the first time in many years. And I showed up for the first day of my school, and I was called into the counselor's office, and my records were taken out. And they said, we've been looking at your records. 
We don't want your trouble in this school. If we begin to see any of it, you're out. And that was day one, getting off to a good start. And uh, I still had an attitude, and I said, you know what? Thanks. And I walked out of his office, and I called my father, which I hadn't really been on great terms with. Um, but I, I explained to him in a good way that I ain't going to make it in this school. You know, it's been a long time since I've been in regular school. They're not really giving me a hell of a good chance. I got a good idea. Why don't you sign me out of school? You're a successful businessman. I'll come work for you. And he said that he would think about it and he would talk to his partner. And um, he got back to me and he said they agreed that that's what they were going to do. Um, so it was a cold October morning, the week of my birthday. And I woke up that morning. And I went to the bus stop, really proud that I'm going to be a working man this week and um, going to do the right thing. And it's my birthday. And a friend of mine came over, and he gave me a nice little birthday present. He gave me a little bottle of Jack Daniels. And um, I put it in my coat. And I said, you know what, this weekend I'm going to celebrate that I'm making my family proud, and I'm proud that I'm working, and I'm celebrating my birthday. And um, that was my original thought, and I started to get cold, I guess, so a little sip will warm me up. And then on the bus, I guess I remembered how I got through school when I was nervous, and I was nervous going to work the first day, so I continued to finish that little bottle of Jack Daniels, walk into work for the first day, and completely know how to run the whole business. You can't tell me anything. It made a complete fool of myself and my father wasn't my intention when I woke up that morning. My intention was to do the right thing. All the times before that that I drank, I drank because I wanted to drink. I drank because I loved to drink. I drank because drinking was fun. Not that morning. Not that morning. I didn't have a choice that morning. I didn't know it. But I drank against my own free will without even knowing it. That continued for years and years and years, and the stories got a lot worse, and anybody ever wants my phone number and call, we'll talk one-on-one -on -one about a lot of the horror stories, um, the war stories, this isn't the place for them, um, but I was young then, and trust me, the stories got worse. Um, in 1987, I was hanging out, I was, I was married for the first time, um, to a detox nurse, 10 years older than me. That was going to sober me up. Uh, didn't work. Um, but a friend of mine, there was a house that we hung out at. Three brothers um, owned the house. We all owned motorcycles. They never left the garage. Very few of them ever left the garage. Um, it had some really bad nicknames in the neighborhood. None of the other homeowners or anybody that lived in the neighborhood would walk past that house. They'd cross over the street and around. Um, one of the brothers was showing up with new friends every day and getting on the, his bike and taking off. I started to get curious one night, and I said, Hey, Warren, how come you ain't hanging out no more? Where you been going? I couldn't live like this anymore, and I got sober. Going to AA meetings, I laughed and said, oh, that's nice. You know, take it easy. And I went back to doing what I wanted to do, you know, uh, what everybody else was doing. And uh, every once in a while I would talk to Warren. And I woke up one morning and something told me to just call him up and ask him where one of these meetings are. And I did. Warren told me where the meeting was. He said, I can't make it tonight. But the condition you're in and... If you can make it there, they'll know you're new. They'll make you feel comfortable. It works for me. This is where it is. Just show up. I sweated it out through the day, and I got there real early, and it was in a school. And I was walking around the school and around the school, starting to lose hope and saying, you know, forget it. I'm just going to go drink. And the guy came over, and he grabbed me. And he said, you're looking for the AA meeting? And I went, um, yeah, I am. And he said, come with me, I'm setting it up. So I followed him into the meeting, and they sat down in one of the chairs. It was in a classroom, and he started putting all the stuff up and hanging up the shades and being real busy, and I was sitting there watching him. And he came over to me, and he handed me a little blue card, and he said, you want to read this? And I said, sure. 
And now I had something to look at. I didn't have to watch as the room was filling up. I didn't have to look anybody in the eye, and I just kept sitting there and pretending to read this card. And he opened up the meeting, and he said, and to read the preamble, we have bought. And my heart jumped right out of my toes. I said, if this is what AA is about, it's not for me. And I spent the next, what felt like three hours, what was probably three minutes, trying to figure out how am I getting out of here with nobody noticing. Because I didn't realize he wanted me to read it out loud. I thought he just wanted me to read it, and I was scared to death. Um, so I got out of the meeting, and I got lost in the school. I thought I was going to be arrested for trespassing. I certainly didn't look as clean as the rest of the people in the meeting. Um, but I found my way back to where the room that the meeting was in. I leaned outside in the hallway, and I just figured when everybody leaves the meeting, I'll just follow them out, and I'll get out of the school, and I'll go back to drink, and I'll just slowly die of alcoholism, and I don't really care. I didn't even know it was alcoholism. I just knew that I was drinking myself to death. Um, I knew that drinking was a problem for years. Um, I got surrounded. Surrounded and convinced to go back to the diner. And I don't do that stuff well. I still don't do that stuff well. I'm not still one of those that goes back to the diner too often. But um, they convinced me to go to the diner. They convinced me to come back to a meeting the next day. Um, I continued to go to meetings for a long time with them. Um, eventually, they started to avoid me because I wanted to drink really bad. I wouldn't tell them I wanted to drink. Um, I'd had go into the meetings, and they'd offer me $20 to raise my hand and just say my name. My answer would be, you know what, my problems are none of their business, and I'm really not interested in this. You know, that was my attitude. Um, so I can't imagine why in 1995 I had a horrible relapse. Um, never did anything in Alcoholics Anonymous. Eventually, each one of those people, too, they would avoid me. If I was walking to a meeting, they would duck me. Um, I was just so angry and so miserable. Um, but if I was willing... To ask them for help, they were always there. You know, and I'll never forget that. Um, you know, if I, if I would be able to grab them, they would stand there and they would talk. They'd bring me back to the diner. They really had great intentions. You know, they, they didn't have the answer I needed. I know that today. Um, not their fault, but they had good intentions. Um, 95, sometime around there. Um, Married for the second time um, prior to that. Um, had a beautiful little girl, daughter. Um, and, I, and I relapsed. And I woke up the next morning and I didn't understand. You know, what am I going to do now? Like, okay, AA's not obviously working and I've always been miserable. Picking up didn't really work. Uh, what now? Um, called up my boss, asked him for an easy day of work. Filled with that guilt, remorse, and shame the entire day. Uh, knew that it wasn't the answer to go back out and drink again. Um, went to bed that night, woke up the next morning, and I really remember saying, you know what? Two days ago wasn't so bad. And there I went again. And I continued that back and forth for quite a few months. When I say my sober date is June 12th. 95, I'm really not sure that it's June 12th. It's approximately that. Me and my landlord just tried to figure out when things quieted down again. Um, and that's when we made it my sober date. Um, but what ended up happening was very interesting. Um, I was in a complete rage one night, full of anger of what was going on in a neighborhood looking for trouble that I didn't belong in. Um, and in this rage, somehow I ended up back in an AA meeting that night. And I couldn't tell you today, other than God carrying me there, um, I don't remember driving there. Um, but I got to this meeting, and it was a meeting I was never in before. There was a bunch of young people there, boys, girls, um, as young as 16, um, as old as probably 25 maybe, um, and a few you know, people my age, but um, they were just loving life. 
and they were having fun, and they were loving sobriety, and they would, you know, drag me out to meetings with them, and drag me to the city, and, you know, every night of the week they were going to a meeting, and then they were going to the city, to a club, to listen to music, and I wasn't getting it, because for the, for the years of my dry spell, Anybody that went to a club, I love music, anybody that went to a club to hear a band, to hear music, to go to a concert, had a miserable time and I had to drag them out because it wasn't long before I said, I have to get out of here, I'm really uncomfortable, there's way too much drinking in here for me. Um, and I didn't get how they were staying and having fun and, you know, all these girls were coming up with these new drinks that I had never experienced and like I wasn't getting it. How are they doing this? They must not be as alcoholic as I am, you know. Um, so one night one of them was celebrating his anniversary. My good friend today, Artie, he was celebrating his one year anniversary and his sponsor was sharing from the podium. Um, he was rolling around on the floor, making me laugh hysterical about, you know, reaching for the phone and dialing 911 and just really expressing how bad it was for him, and I was relating to it. Then he started to talk about how great life was today and how he was a recovered member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, it's very important for me today, as, as I have come to, in some meditation and reflection, I've realized, and listening to... Um, a tape that I recently listened to um, from outside of AA. One of the respectful and humble things that we do is we introduce ourselves by our name and our illness, you know, and that's it. My name is Bart, and I'm an alcoholic, and that's very humbling. And it really is a shame that he had to attract me, and it didn't work in the way he hoped, but it worked, um, and how I continue and many other people continue to say that we're recovered members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll just say for myself, before I get back to the story, that there's two reasons that I do that. Um, one is to remind myself that in 1987, we read at every meeting, those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Well, in 87, I wouldn't. So, of course, I didn't. In 95, I would. So here I said I did. And I continue to give myself to this simple program, Designed for Living, and I stay recovered. Um, and the most important reason is to give newcomers hope. You know, Charlie talked about, you know, the serenity, the courage, and the wisdom. Well, I don't think I'm given that, but I hope I'm given hope. You know, that, that's really what we do up here is we give hope. You know, when we reach out to a newcomer, we give hope. Um, well, Eric wasn't giving me at that moment a whole lot of hope. Um, talking about being recovered, talking about being happy, joyous, and free, going where any other person can go without disaster. Um, what he was giving me was anger, um, a lot of it. And I didn't think any of it was possible. And I looked over at Audie and I said, that's your sponsor speaking up there for your anniversary, huh? And he goes, yeah, why? And I said, I think tonight you should find a new one. And he asked me why. And I said, because I'm going to kill him. And he smiled at me and he said, you know what, I'm sure he'd love to talk to you. So he talked to his sponsor that night and um, they set up for me to go. He, he had his own store not too far away in the neighborhood. So I went and set up for me to go to the store. And I was really going there because I was convinced that he was going to piss me off more and I was going to kill him. And that I was going to be justified for it because he was messing with my life and a lot of other people's lives. So therefore, I really had a good reason to do it. Um, and every time I got close to him, he backed away, but he kept for about two hours talking about himself and describing his alcoholism and the things that he did and humorous stories and horrible stories. And he did this for about two hours. And I finally said to him, what do I have to do to get what you got today? And I don't know if I worded it exactly like that, but I know he looked at me, he stepped towards me and he went, I'm glad you finally asked. And then he said, just read the first 164 pages of the book Alcoholics Anonymous, the big book. Do exactly what it says, and you'll have what I have. And I went, well, see you later. And he said, what's the matter? And I said, I've never read a book in my life. There's no way. And he grabbed me at the shoulder this time. He wasn't scared anymore. He knew he had me. 
And he said, not so fast. I'll tell you what. I'll read the book to you. The only stupid question is the one you don't ask. When you identify the things, we're going to talk about it. When you don't identify the things, he says, that's because you've never done it. But you'll be willing to practice it for the rest of your life. Sound like a good deal to me. So we met every few days, and that's what we did. We sat down and we experienced that book together. Um, I learned what you people were saying about don't pick up the first one and you won't get drunk. You know, I, I used to hate that because I thought it was just about you can't skip over the first one. You know, I never listened to anything that you people were talking about, so I didn't know anything about the physical allergy. I was around for a long time. I may have heard it one in one ear, out the other. It made sense what the doctor was talking about. <sighs> Man, was I relieved. I know what's wrong with me. And I felt really good. We continued to read that great book, and I started to cry. Um, I started to get really scared. More about alcoholism. There is a solution. The alcoholic mind, not having a choice. I remember, whew, I can't remember how many years I woke up how many mornings and said, I am not going to drink today, no matter what. I can't drink today. You know? My ex-wife and my daughter are letting me back in their life. I can go visit and take my daughter to, out to the park, go to the movies or something, and showed up and fell on the lawn with the truck practically driven up on the lawn, you know. Um can't play back those old tapes. They didn't work. It was scary, but it was true. I had that alcoholic mind. I was of the hopeless variety. You know, I, I had some dry time for a little while, but I had no reason to pick up the night I did, and I did. Um, I had all the reasons in the world not to, and I did anyway. Um, so that was enough to scare me. I grew up in a family of mixed religion. Religion was never talked about. Um, God was never mentioned. Um, so when we got up to this, you know, there either is a God or there isn't. Well, I was convinced enough that he believed, that all these young people believed, um, that something is doing all of this, you know, this whole world. <clears throat> so I said, God is. That is my choice. Um, and then I proceeded to make the most important decision that any of us can ever make in Alcoholics Anonymous, or in life in general, in, in my opinion, and that's to turn my will and my life over to the care of God, as I didn't understand them, but that was fine to start. Um, and that if it worked, if this God really changed my life, transformed my thinking, did all of these promises, that, that this taking this step, it says it's going to do, um, or making this decision and proceeding on really is going to do, I will absolutely bear witness to anybody that wants to listen. And in the beginning, even if you didn't want to listen, but I got better at that. Um, but yes, I would, I would absolutely bear witness for God if it works. And that was the decision that we're asked to make. And it's the best decision we could make. That's all I could say. He handed me a pen and he said, everybody you've met, You've got a resentment against. I already know that just from the short talks we've had. So don't think about anything other than everybody you've ever met and write down their names. Every place you've ever been, you might as well write them too. And every rule that you've ever been told to follow, you might as well add them to it too. And he was right, and that's what I did. And then I wrote the reasons why and continued to write all the lists and continued to do the you know fears and the sex harms and, you know, it was interesting, too. You know, it's important that um, he did actually ask me in that third step decision if I had any type of idea of what God might be or what God might look like, because I really had none, you know. So I came up with this brainstorm, and I said, yeah, God is love. And he started cracking up, and I said, well, why is that funny? And he said, well, let's look at your life right now. You've got a, you're 30 years old. Got a 20 year old little Brazilian girlfriend, a wife. That doesn't sound like a good love. Is that really what you want God to be like? Nope. He said, let's start from zero. You don't know anything. And that's where I started from. Um, 
Um, so I wrote all these resentments and fears and sex harms and, um, and shared them with them and went into that reflection of, you know, what I've done so far, good and solid. And he explained it as a volcano, um, that all the stuff that came out at this point was what was on the surface. And there was going to be years that it was all going to be continuing to surface. And I was going to write many more inventories to come. And I was going to be out there living life and adding new stuff to it. And he's been right. For 12 years, that's what I've been doing. You know, open for business, but writing inventories and new stuff comes up and, you know, old stuff surfaces. Um, and went out and started doing all the amends. And there was a lot of amends. Um, there was a lot of people I couldn't find. Um, and over the years, they've popped up in my life. God has been really good to me with that. Um, the first one that popped up out of nowhere was um, my first wife had a son that was nine years younger than me. Um, I was online the bank, and he was a big kid. Um, he wasn't a kid anymore, and... Uh, I recognized him right away, and I asked him if he would be willing, after we get out of the bank, to have a talk with me, and he said, yeah, and I was nervous. We ended up having a great talk. Um, I see him now and then in the neighborhood. Um, I actually met the woman that he had married. Um, they were in a Mexican restaurant one night, and I sent them over drinks, and he came over to thank me, and I thought it was pretty young at the time uh, when this happened. And uh, he sat down with us, and when he left, my daughter said, who was that? And I, she never didn't know I had been married before because I was in a blackout that whole marriage, so I never really talked about that marriage. So she got to find out that I, her father had been married once before. Um, a lot of the amends have been, you know, a lot of people threw me out. I mean, his mother... I still haven't seen since the day we signed the papers. She knew through him and through other people that I would like to make amends, but her response was just stay out of my life. So that's what I do. And I really don't have any reason to be in her life other than to make good for what I did. And the best way to do that sometimes is to stay away. So that's what I do. Um, I remember one of the funny amends that I got to make. Um, well, actually, this was a good one. Um, I work on boilers, and I was in somebody's house one day about three years ago, and uh, there was an old couple there, and the husband said to me, you look very familiar. And I went, uh-oh. That could never be a good thing, but I wasn't scared because I knew if I'd done wrong. You know? um, so he asked me, you know, he said he was a school teacher, and he asked me what school that he went to, and that school that I was causing chaos in for the, like, three quarters of a year before I got sent to Project 25, he was a teacher there, and uh, he was one of the teachers I caused havoc to, um, but I got a chance to bring a lot, of, I watched him and his wife get this great joy in their life by listening to how much I've changed, what my life is like now, they were in the middle of getting ready to move. Um, they had boxes packed, and they opened up a box that had all these spiritual books and said, you know what, we've read all of them, and help yourself, you know, continue the path that you're on. Um, and they were real happy that day, and that was cool, you know. Um, it's been a lot of good ones. Um, that's the step that I watch a lot of people walk on. And for me and so many other people that I know, it's been one of the greatest steps. Um, year and a half, two years ago, during the season, I was sent up to Westchester County to work on a commercial boiler, and this thought came into my head that I bet you I'm not too far from Hawthorne Cedar Knolls. I haven't been up there since I was there. Um, it never crossed my mind that I might own amends there, and it wasn't crossing my mind at that minute. It was just I might not, must not be too far from there. I got a GPS which was really frustrating today trying to get here as it wasn't working, but we, we made it. Um, I put in Hawthorne Cedar Knolls. I put in a fake address, got off the exit, and canceled the address because it was a fake address once I was in the town of Hawthorne. And just said, God, please direct me to this place. And got right up there. Came through the gates. Nobody stopped me. Started driving around. 
knew right the cottage that I was in and stopped and started reflecting. Um, and it wasn't good memories. Um, somebody came across the lawn and asked if they could help me. And I went, you know where the main office is? I don't know why I asked that at the moment. But she said, yeah, when you first walked in the gate, it's the building right ahead of you. Now, as I was driving around, I saw that they had a drug and alcohol center, like a building that was strictly for that. When I was there, they never mentioned anything about it, and they didn't address it. You were a piece of garbage. You were never going to grow up to be anything, and you don't know how to treat your family. And you know, that's all it was about. You know, There was no drug and alcohol treatment there. Um, so I went to the office. I parked in front. And I started sitting there, and I got quiet, and I said, all right, God, why am I here? And I still had not a clue. Somebody walked out of the building and said, can I help you? And I said, well, I was here in, I think, 1977, 1978, um, and I was just wondering if anybody still works here from back then. I'd like to talk to them. And they said, so-and-so, the bus driver, is still here, and um, I'm not sure who else might be, but you can go in the office and ask and if you'd like. And I said, all right, um, all right, thanks. And they left, and I thought about it, and I went into the office, and I went through the same story of why I was there. And um, But I started to continue that I made some harms up here in some people's lives and jobs difficult, and I wanted an opportunity to talk to them. Um, and they said that nobody was there but the new director. If I want to talk to him, I could. And my first answer is obvious. No thanks, but thanks anyway. And I started to walk out, and I had one foot out the door, and I just had that, heard that voice, yes, you do. And I, and I, and I, and I turned around, and I said, you know what? Yeah, I would like to talk to him. So I went in there, and, and you know, he welcomed me, shook my hand, and we sat down, and you know, I started to talk to him about how great it was that I thought saw, saw that he addresses alcoholism and drug addiction with the young kids today, and that when I was there, it didn't. He started to tell me when they made those changes, and it was a great conversation. Um, as I was leaving, he said that they were celebrating, and right now I don't remember. I think it was 75 years that summer. Um, of being up there, and that if I wanted an opportunity to come and be an inspirational speaker to the kids, that he would love to have me. And that made me feel great. Um, still makes me feel great, but he never called again, so I didn't get an opportunity to do it. But I have his card, and I'm going to call again um, and see if I can still be of service to them, because um, I know there was a reason that I was brought up there. Um, nobody else was there. They, they said they would check for my records to see if they can get in touch, help me to get in touch with any of the people were there, and my records were burned because it was X amount of years after they burned them. Um, anyway, as I started doing, you know, that amends earlier on, I was doing practicing 10, 11. Um, it was difficult in the beginning. Um, sometimes it still is. Sometimes um, I do things more than others. I'm a seeker. Um, I love God. God is the most important thing to me in my life today. Um, I wouldn't have the life, and none of us would have the life we have today. God is in the center of everything and every relationship that I have. Um, and that's why I have good relationships. Um, I very rarely get angry. I was a person who used to have short fuse. Ten step is a great thing. Pause when agitated and doubtful. Ask God for the right thought of direction. If I don't do that, it can get ugly. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we went up, me, Tara, my daughter, and Tara's daughter went up to uh, New Falls for Tara's birthday. And it took us, I don't know, an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half to get up there, and almost five hours to get home. Uh, handled the, the traffic coming home pretty good. On the way home, I figured I'd pick up the van for work the next morning, um, when I got to the van, was, we live in Long Beach and work is in Queens and it's a long trip and it makes sense to just, you know, take it home the night before and leave my car there. There was no keys in the van. Five hours of driving home. Now I got to get up at four in the morning instead of five in the morning. I'm not very happy. So I called up my boss and I walked away from our car because I didn't want everybody to hear the conversation and I freaked. And, uh, when I got back in the car, I, Tara had said to me quietly, 
uh, her daughter said that she's never heard me say anything more than the word shit. And she was a little shocked. And my daughter said, yeah, it's been a lot of years since I've seen my father get that angry. You know? And that's because of practicing our 10th step. You know? I have a great relationship with my daughter today because I practice the 10th step. She's a kid. She does things wrong. I don't lose my cool. I don't get anywhere. Eleven step has been a great experience. Um, Twelve, you know, I practiced the first eleven steps so that we're capable of doing the twelfth step. Had about three months sober. Eric, my sponsor, um, came to that home group, which he hadn't been back to since Artie's anniversary, and he came with us that night. And this huge young kid with no teeth, tattooed angry, start sharing how he hates all of us. He, the, he was in, there was a rehab that came into our home group and he was with the rehab and um, he was just full of anger and he hates all of us and he doesn't want to be here and just full of rage and Eric turned around to me and he said, after the meeting's over, I want you to go over to that guy and win the confidence of him and see if you could sponsor him and show him what I've just showed you. I said, are you nuts? <laughs> and, and, and it wasn't because he was big, and it wasn't because he was angry, and it was, what do I got to give? You know, and this guy doesn't want it anyway. It's pretty clear. And he opened up to a vision for you. You're just one man who, with this book in your hand, and you just tapped into a power greater than yourself. You know what? The book hasn't been wrong yet. So I'm going to believe this. And you know what? I went up to that kid, and I got to talk to him for a little while, and he continued to come every week, and we continued to talk a little more. And before I knew it, I was able to take him through the steps and watch him recover, you know. And um, actually, we got really close. And I remember he, had, you know, his um, he had a little boy, and he was a single father. And um, he had said that if anything ever happened to him, he wanted me to adopt his son. Um, and I made him a deal I would unless it was that you picked up. If you pick up, if you, if you do something to him because of that, then not a chance. Um, but he also lived with his mother, and the kid was well taken care of. He stayed sober for three years, and he helped a tremendous amount of people, and a lot of them are still around today. Um, he struggles to get back and do what we do. Um, I don't know what he's doing right now. Um, I heard he moved back to Pennsylvania, and I, and I hope that he's doing exactly what I'm doing tonight, giving people hope. That's all I could hope for and pray for. I include them in my prayers. But there are a lot of people who he did help that are still around. Um, so this program works. Um, you know, if you knew, um, get the fellowship that you crave. And I remember Eric, my sponsor, was, he was an older man when he first started to sponsor me. And um, he started to get really sick. He had diabetes. He was starting to lose parts of his feet, you know. Um, he had kidney dialysis three times a week. He was wheelchair bound and most of the time he spent in his bed, but he still had people come to his house and he still read that big book to people who wanted to get better. Um, he continued to carry that message till the day he went into a coma, um, and he left us. Um, and Don Pritz, you know, another guy who also carry the message to the day he died. Those are the people that I want the passion to carry the message to give hope. You know, Not the people that I looked out my window when I was a kid and said I want to be just like them. You now it's the Eric's and the Don's and you know people like that, all of you that have the passion to carry this message. You know, that's the passion that I have that I never want to lose till the day I die. Um, but I remember Eric he had an ego that was, and we always goofed on, I told him there wasn't a pin in the world big enough to pop his ego. But he used it to win the confidence of other people. You know, he used it for a beneficial fact, and some of them was to just piss people like me off. But he got me. However it was, he got me. It's not the approach I use. I tried it for a long time. It didn't work. I got quiet in meditation and said, you know, because it's important. How can we best get as many people hooked as we can? Um, but there was a new meeting that started, and it was a one-year anniversary. And um, 
It's something that I'll always remember. They got Eric to come speak for this group anniversary using his ego. It was really his anniversary. But if they, if we said that it was for his anniversary, he wouldn't have come. But to speak for a group anniversary and there's going to be a lot of people there, absolutely just, can you wheel me down the stairs in the wheelchair and I'll be there to speak. So we got him there and uh, he walked in, he saw a bunch of us and myself and another guy who he had sponsored early on and a newcomer had spoken at the meeting. But before they started the meeting, they said, has everybody who's been sponsored by Eric, please stand up. And a bunch of us stood up. And we remained standing. And they said, is everybody, would everybody that's been sponsored by the people who just stood up, please stand up. And a bunch more people stood up. And they continued to keep doing that until everybody in the room, except for one or two newcomers, was standing. And that's what can happen for every single person that sits in this room. The fellowship can grow up around you. Um, you tap into that power of God. You practice this design for living, and you will watch people recover from alcoholism, their families get back together, or grow families, and just have unbelievable lives like I have today. I mean, it's got its trials and low spots, and I have friends and relationships, and, you know, life is going to be life. But I have never been more happy in my life. Um, and that's the hope I hope to give to everybody. Thanks for listening to me tonight and an opportunity to share. God bless. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.